Most of my presentation will relate to children and young people with developmental disabilities who have mental health problems, and that is because I am a child and adolescent psychiatrist. However, everything I say is relevant to adults with developmental disabilities as well, so I want us to think about everything I say in terms of a lifespan perspective. The second preliminary comment that I want to share with you is that in the United Kingdom, we believe passionately in community-based assessment and intervention services. I am a specialist in this field, but I work in the community. I work in a child development centre, which is away from the main hospitals, and I work with colleagues, not just in the field of health, but also education and social services as well. And within the health team that I work, I have colleagues in clinical psychology, in psychiatric social work, in mental health nursing, and also in family and individual psychotherapy. So we believe passionately not only in community-based services, but also in multidisciplinary approaches. What I want to do in my presentation is firstly to share with you our understanding of what we mean by developmental disabilities and the forms that they can take, and then to explore how the mental health challenges present in this group of individuals, how common they are, and then to move on to think how we can assist in their management. Because there are two themes which are particularly in our minds when we work in this field. One is the need for evidence-based practice that Dr. Stavsky already started to share with you. That is the appliance of science providing the evidence for what works and what doesn't. But even more important is the need for what we call cost-effective services. What can we financially afford? We live in a real world. There are enormous numbers of competing pressures for money to be spent on those. And we need to be able to justify not only why our clients are important, which we agree they are, but also why the services we provide give good value for money as well as being useful. So I'd like us to keep all these concepts in our minds throughout the presentation. I'd like to commence with us considering this question and thinking about what are the key factors in defining developmental disabilities. And the first is that these are conditions which are a very early onset and continue in the long term. In some instances, they commence even before birth, for example, in genetic conditions. But another key issue is that they are frequently multiple. It is very rare to find an individual with just one developmental disability. And Dr. Stavsky has already mentioned the concept of diagnostic overshadowing, whereby all the individual's problems and challenges get inappropriately attributed to one issue. <laughs> However, in this area of health care and support, we need to think about a whole range of issues relating to psychological functioning and psychological need, and also how they interact with each other. And of course, these disabilities are important because they interfere with normal development. What surprises me, as a developmental psychiatrist, is not that some individuals have problems in development, Human psychology is so complicated that it would be surprising if that weren't the case. However, what to me is more surprising is that most of us don't have developmental disabilities, despite all the problems we experience. And I think we need to still learn an enormous amount about what makes most of us resilient, but what results in a few of us being vulnerable to these challenges. And of course, these challenges are vital for at least two reasons. Firstly, they interfere with the individual's ability to maximize their potential, to realize their true skills and abilities in all fields of life. But secondly, and very importantly, they interfere with the quality of life. And I think this is a very important concept 
because even now we tend to overfocus perhaps on individual symptoms rather than thinking about the welfare of the individual and indeed their family. And I will come back to how we may be able to measure these important issues later on. There are a number of different developmental disabilities and much of my time will be spent talking about intellectual disability. As most of you will be aware, there have been a number of different phrases used to describe this issue, ranging through mental retardation and mental subnormality, to learning disabilities and learning difficulties and developmental delays. But increasingly, and I'm reassured to hear this is the case in Israel as well, we're using the term intellectual disability. Why? Because firstly, we are considering the individual's intellectual or so-called cognitive abilities in the broadest sense. And secondly, we are concerned with the functional disadvantages that arise out of the impairments that they have or experience. And it is important to bear in mind that although I am a medically qualified practitioner, these challenges, these impairments, and indeed these disabilities arise out of social and psychological, if not more so, than biological issues. But we're also aware of the other important group of developmental disabilities relating to problems in social and language functioning primarily, and those have the label of autism or autistic spectrum disorders. A group which I won't talk about so much, but are very important in that they are very common and produce enormous disability and disadvantage is the field of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. But quite frequently, as we've already heard, individuals who have the first or second condition in my list will also have the third. And all of these need to be identified, diagnosed, and hence have the potential to be treated appropriately. And then we have a range of more specific developmental disorders, which are also known as specific learning difficulties, for example, dyslexia and dyspraxia. And these are important as well. But although they can occur in individuals with the above conditions, often they don't. And so I won't be referring to them that much. But I will be spending a short amount of time telling you why I think that where we can find the cause of the disabilities, it is of vital importance, not just in terms of understanding in the individual about why they are the way they are or why your family is the way that she is, but also it gives us a lot of information about the challenges the individual might face and hence giving us the potential to intervene as early as possible and as appropriately as possible to be of assistance. The message I want to share with you at this point relates to the fact that when we are discussing intellectual disabilities or autism spectrum conditions, we are thinking of them as developmental disabilities, as disabilities as defined on my earlier slide. They are not psychiatric disorders, they are not mental illnesses, why then, you might ask, is Jeremy presenting on this topic as a psychiatrist, and it's a good question. And the answer is because if you have these developmental disabilities, then sadly, but realistically, you are much more vulnerable to mental health challenges. They used to be a myth that if you had a developmental disability, you could not, you should not, maybe ide ideologically you must not have a mental illness. Now, thankfully, we live in more enlightened times and we realise, sadly but realistically, that not only can people with developmental disabilities have mental health challenges, but in reality they are much more vulnerable to them than the rest of the population. For a whole range of factors, social, psychological, educational, familial, as well as biological. And as we've heard already, they can have a range of causes. And this is important because some of them can be prevented or treated effectively if the intervention is commenced as early as possible. For example, we know that a number of infective conditions can affect the unborn child adversely, producing lifelong disabilities. 
And this example is very important because there was the myth, the very cruel myth, that the immunization to prevent the child developing rubella would actually cause autism. And this caused enormous damage, and certainly in the United Kingdom, we are now seeing epidemics of this condition that was almost wiped out from the world. And the tragedy, as you probably know, is that rubella, German measles, can actually cause brain damage and lead to intellectual disability and indeed autism. So far from protecting their children from these developmental disabilities by depriving them of the immunization, parents were leaving them vulnerable to possible difficulties. I'm informed reassuringly that fetal alcohol spectrum disorders are not that common in Israel, or maybe we should say are not that often diagnosed in Israel. It may be because of the positive cultural beliefs and systems, both in the Jewish community and in the Islamic community, and we find this in the United Kingdom as well. However, we know that this may well be, on a worldwide level, the most important cause of developmental disabilities. And I will come back to this later, but as Mike used the term, it was reassuring when he broke into English with certain phrases, he said it's not rocket science, and if you bathe one of the most sensitive organs known to humanity, the developing fetal embryonic brain, in one of the most powerful organic solvents known to the world, alcohol, then, as we say in English, you're asking for trouble. You are going to cause profound and long-term developmental disabilities. And you know, the only safe message we can give, because we are unaware of individual mother's vulnerabilities to affecting their child, we are unaware of the individual child's vulnerability to developing this condition, the only safe message one can give is that mothers who are pregnant should not drink any alcohol from the time of conception through to delivery. However, sadly, we are aware that psychological and social factors can contribute to disabilities, and in instances of profound deprivation, social deprivation and abuse and neglect, individuals can suffer even long-term and permanent disabilities. And of course, that's a tragedy, because this is an area where we can do so much in terms of prevention regarding social policy and social support. But frequently the cause is unknown, although when we can find a cause, it's often genetic. And with the recent enormous fantastic developments in our understanding of genetics and inheritance, we are now identifying increasing instances of genetic conditions, variants, that do seem to contribute to developmental disabilities. I want to spend just a minute or two discussing the concept of intelligence because there's often a lot of misunderstanding and confusion about it. We have this so-called normal distribution of intelligence or IQ through the general population. Most people are around the centre, clustering around an IQ of 100, which is the average. But if you move down to the lower end of that diagram, on the left-hand side of the screen, then we have 2 to 3% of individuals who, roughly speaking, have an IQ below 70. This is a consensus agreement. It's agreement between specialists that this group represent the most vulnerable in terms of possibly having an intellectual disability and hence in terms of having mental health challenges as well. So I've heard that in Israel there are perhaps 0.5% of individuals identified as having an intellectual disability, but in reality, by agreement, wherever you are in the world, two to three percent of individuals have the potential to fall into that category. Why do I say have the potential? Because it's not only the level of intellectual functioning which is important, it's also the presence of significant impairments in what we describe as adaptive behaviours and life skills. What do we mean by those? We mean the ability to look after oneself, 
to occupy oneself meaningly, whether it's leisure or play or work. To be able to be self-sufficient, not to have to rely on others financially, but also socially and in terms of care. To be able to determine one's future and make value decisions about oneself and to remain safe. And the diagnostic systems acknowledge that having a low IQ in itself is not sufficient for a diagnosis of intellectual disability. You have to have these significant impairments in adaptive behaviours and life skills, so-called functional impairments, as well. There is, of course, a group of individuals who have profound impairments in adaptive behaviours and life skills and social sufficiency, yet actually have quite a high IQ. And, of course, those are individuals with so-called high-functioning autism or Asperger's syndrome. And this makes the point that IQ in itself is not the most important determinant, although it is a highly relevant one. Some of you will be aware that we now have the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. And this is very important for a number of reasons in terms of definitions, because when we explore DSM-5's approach to intellectual disability, we see that it makes no mention whatsoever of IQ. The concept of IQ has been dropped from the definition. Instead, the focus is on, as you can see, impairments in general mental abilities and the concept of disabilities in adaptive functioning, as defined on the previous slide. And it talks about the ability in three domains of so-called everyday tasks, which are as follows. The conceptual, which is probably the area that would have been covered by IQ tests and the like. The social, being able to relate to other people, understand them, help them in understanding oneself, being able to make and retain friendships, and the practical, the ability to care for yourself, hold down a job, look after your finances, organise yourself and indeed keep safe. And actually the diagnosis is based on the severity of these deficits in adaptive functioning. The footnote, the small print, acknowledges that it is important to understand not so much the exact level of intellectual functioning, but the profile, the pattern of strengths and needs, in terms of being able to fully appreciate the individual's requirements. But we are aware that the rates of mental health problems differ in different groups of individuals. This is information from a very important study which was undertaken in the 1970s in the United Kingdom called the Isle of Wight Study. The Isle of Wight is a beautiful island off the coast of the south of England where life is somewhat slower and more relaxed. And I can share with you that my wife and I plan to retire there. <laughs> where else would a child psychiatrist retire to? But the three perhaps most famous researchers in child and adolescent mental health, Professor Philip Graham, Professor Michael Rutter, and Professor Bill Yule, undertook what's called a total population study, trying to identify the rates of mental health challenges in young people, the factors that influence the frequency and the severity of these problems, and hence how they might be best helped. This research has been replicated, repeated more recently, and I'm sad to share with you that rates haven't really changed. We haven't actually been that good at improving the mental health of young people. We have a long way to go. And as you can see, even when you look at the general population of young people, these are individuals without disabilities, without developmental challenges, almost as many as one in ten have a mental health problem which on the one hand explains perhaps why my clinic is so busy, on the other hand maybe says something very worrying about our societies and how we treat and look after our children. If you have a physical issue, 
say, a chronic long-term illness, not one that affects your brain, so perhaps childhood onset diabetes, congenital heart disease, childhood arthritis, then sadly but not surprisingly you're more vulnerable to mental health problems because of the psychological and social adversities that you face. However, if you have an impairment in the functioning of your brain, and this doesn't have to be... Thank you, that is wonderful. Todaraba. <laughs> this doesn't have to be an issue that creates intellectual disability or even autism. So, for example, epilepsy or cerebral palsy, which are quite consistent with average intellectual ability, nonetheless, the rate of mental health challenges increases to a third. And if you have an IQ of below 50, this is an educational term in the United Kingdom, severe learning difficulties, if you have an IQ below 50, then one in two of you will have a mental health challenge. And I want to share a further concerning statistic with you, which is if in addition you are vulnerable, you are experiencing social deprivation, social disadvantage, poverty, inadequate living and learning circumstances, possible abuse and neglect and other social adversities, you can double these percentages. And as you will be appreciating, if you double the percentage of 50 in the group with what I would call moderate to profound intellectual disability, then tragically, but realistically, you're guaranteed in having a mental health problem. And if you like, this is one of my most important advertisements that I want to share with you, that here we have the group with the highest likelihood of having mental health problems, which will be the most severe in the population. And yet, I would argue that wherever we are in the world, an individual in that group will be receiving the lowest amount of input compared with other groups with mental health problems. As I've said, these developmental disabilities often go together, they co-occur, so that individuals, it's very rare, if at all, to find an individual with purely intellectual disability. Very often, they'll have autism spectrum issues as well, social and language impairments, and indeed many will have ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And our problem is that in medicine, we like to have just one label. Preferably one word to define an individual, to define their whole life experience. In reality, of course, we need to apply different terms, different diagnoses, different labels in order to fully appreciate the individual's predicament and hence how we should be helping them in multiple ways. And as we're already sharing, when we look at the autism spectrum, then whatever your IQ you will be experiencing serious impairments in your ability to relate to other people socially, in your language and communication skills, perhaps most importantly, your so-called receptive language or comprehension, one's ability to understand others, and indeed being preoccupied with obsessional rituals, which will depend on your level of intellectual functioning, so that those with severe intellectual disability will tend to have repetitive behaviours such as hand flapping and rocking and humming and gazing at their fingers near their eyes, for example, whereas those with a high IQ may have more academic obsessional interests. So within the United Kingdom, you might find individuals who are obsessed with the routes of the London bus system and the numbers and the stops with the names of every single king and queen and prince and princess of Britain there's been since the Norman Conquest, and even more strange uh, obsessions like uh, the Latin names of every fish on the planet, uh, or the different sort of windscreen wipers on the car that you can find. So some of these obsessions can be quite bizarre, but along with that the individuals often lack the important imaginary skills our ways of thinking that don't relate necessarily to the concrete real world, which are very important. And then there are a couple of areas which people don't talk about so much, but I think are vital. And the first are the so-called sensory sensitivities, to do with sight, smell, sound, taste, touch, and very often profound dislike, aversion, for certain sensations in people on the autism spectrum 
will lead to what we call challenging behaviours, extreme outbursts, and it's not uncommon for an individual to be referred to my clinic with a request, please see this child with severe aggression and self-injury who has autism and please medicate. And as soon as one starts exploring the reasons behind these challenging behaviours, then very rapidly one identifies the reality that we should be addressing not just the individual, but their living circumstances and their environment and how they're being treated in order to sympathetically understand and hence address their particular sensory issues. There are also motor issues as well. Individuals can have problems with motor coordination, dyspraxia, certain walking difficulties as well sometimes, so this is not a mild condition. And you know, I am actually quite happy, many aren't, but I am quite happy that in DSM-5 the term Asperger syndrome is not going to be used anymore. Why am I happy? Because people always defined Asperger syndrome as a mild form of autism. It is not mild, it is very severe, and I would prefer to define it, if I had to, as an extremely severe form of autism, yet one that is curiously paradoxically often associated with reasonable intellectual ability. But that do, shouldn't deceive us about the severity of the issues. So as you can see when we're talking about autism spectrum disorders or DSM-5, then it's a single diagnostic term, but the criteria are still similar. And we also acknowledge that although the features develop in childhood, even if we haven't recognized them clinically, then an adult can still be diagnosed with a condition when they're identified later, because these are lifelong tendencies and attributes. There's been research showing just how common mental health challenges are in individuals with autism spectrum conditions, and as you can see from this slide, almost three quarters of individuals with an autism spectrum disorder also have a psychiatric disorder. They also have a mental illness. It's usually treatable, but sadly often it's undiagnosed, unidentified, and hence unmanaged. Children with autism tend to have more anxiety states and higher levels of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, as well as oppositional defiant disorder. Adolescents with autism have much higher rates of mood disorders. And one of our current clinical research projects is mapping the experiences and the difficulties of adolescents, often females, and females with autism are often undiagnosed, but we're finding a lot more now as we're searching for more, who have often very severe clinical depression. If you have difficulties understanding emotions, telling other people about how you're feeling, which is the case in autism, then it's going to make diagnosis of a mood disorder far more difficult, but it also makes it far more important that we suspect this condition, that we identify it, and that we treat it. And the good news is if we treat it appropriately with cognitive psychotherapies, and if necessary with antidepressant medication, these individuals do very, very well. This is just some information that we've been identifying on the females on the autism spectrum. And the single message I'd share with you from the second half of this slide is that we are starting to believe that the wisdom we have all learnt, that these conditions are far more common in males than females, may not actually be true. Because when we say they're far more common, what we're really meaning is that identified individuals are much more often males than females, but we are believing that there are many females who remain unidentified and hence unhelped. We've talked about the association between autism and mental health, and I just want to share some data on the association between intellectual disability and autism. There's some debate about the exact percentages now, but it's fair to say that the majority of children who have an autism spectrum condition also have intellectual disability. And many of them have a severe intellectual disability. It's in fact not that common to have a very high IQ in autism, 
but it does occur, and as we've already shared, it can produce profound difficulties. But generally, as one's intellectual disability reduces, sorry, becomes more severe, so the likelihood of having an autism disorder increases. And when I visit schools for children with so-called severe learning difficulties, that is for children who have an IQ, roughly speaking, below 50, I can probably identify as many as one in two of the children as having autistic features as well. These conditions aren't just important clinically, they're very common. We've shared that intellectual disability, the whole range from IQ 70 downwards, affects 2-3% to of the population. If one looks at an IQ below 50, it's still 1 in 200. That's a lot of people. ADHD, as many as 3 to 5%. And the autism spectrum, the, the rate has probably increased since I prepared this slide. Every time a study is done, the rate seems to increase. I don't think we're creating people with autism. I think they've always been here, but they've been neglected, unidentified, perhaps been given diagn different diagnostic labels like mental retardation, and perhaps people have been more reluctant to come forward to have their family members diagnosed. But now we're aware just how common these problems are, and also how severe the consequences, not just of autism, but intellectual disability can be. And as an example of that, I want to focus for a small while on the area of self-injury, which is often one of the most distressing and challenging, not just for carers and professionals, but I want to emphasize to you for the individuals with intellectual disability and autism as well. And it is not infrequent for me to see an individual with severe developmental disabilities who is presenting with severe self-injury pleading with me to be restrained, pleading with me to do something about their predicament. They are not enjoying it. They are not creating any pleasure out of it. They are individuals in extreme distress, unhappiness, and indeed at risk of doing themselves serious physical harm. We're aware that your likelihood of self-injuring, or indeed so in other challenging behaviour, and the severity of these symptoms and hence the difficulty in their being treated has very psychological, very behavioural roots. Often in terms of what we call maladaptive learning, where, for example, an individual in an unresourced and understimulating environment may find that, in fact, the only way, the only way to get attention from a carer is to behave sufficiently dramatically to gain their attention. And ultimately, self-injury may be the only way of doing that. However, what you do, and this is an important example of the interaction between the social and the biological, what you do is very genetically determined. So, for example, there's a rare but important condition, a genetic condition called lesch 9 syndrome, where the individuals are particularly vulnerable to biting at the knuckles on their fingers, to the extent that the skin can actually be worn away. Individuals with another genetic condition, Cornelia de Lange syndrome, tend to hit their heads more, as well as being very hyperactive. And there's a condition, Fragile X syndrome, which I've studied a lot, where individuals tend to bite the base of their thumb in response to anxiety or excitement. Some of you may have heard of a condition called prader willi syndrome, a genetic disorder, where the self-injury, if you like, is the enormous overeating. They never stop feeling hungry. They develop severe and even life-threatening obesity, and they also present with impulsive tantrums and indeed picking at their skin. So there are a whole range of conditions, a whole range of both social and biological important factors contributing to the challenges in very common disorders. I hope, therefore, I've answered this question as to why we should have a service. But we know that when we ask individuals with these conditions, when we ask their carers and families, what are the greatest challenges, we hear that they are the emotional and behavioural ones. And that is the rationale 
That is the argument for having a well-resourced and functioning dual diagnosis service in this field. We're aware as well that the severity and frequency of the challenges relate not just to the intellectual impairment and its severity, but they also predict what will happen in the future. They predict the quality of life and the dependency needs of the individual. And sadly, as we've already heard, they also predict intense emotional challenges for the whole family, if not the community. And sadly, it's very common in my work to see individuals with these challenges who are living with a single parent, usually, but not always, the mother, usually in social isolation, <coughs> detached from their community, vulnerable, not being in touch with important services, and suffering. And suffering also in terms of the carer often having developed a mental health problem as a consequence of the challenges and adversities they face. So how do we go about helping? Well, the first step is to think about how these problems would present in an individual with intellectual disability. And the first most important way I want to share with you is that they can present just the same as in with everybody else. And we've shared already this concept of diagnostic overshadowing where one might say, oh, well, it's the intellectual disability. But that's not the case. We do not subscribe to the view that intellectual disability in itself means that you have challenging behaviours or mental health problems that have to be accepted. They do not have to be accepted. They can be helped. But also, as we've shared, if you have difficulties in communicating with others, in sharing important information on your own emotional state, it will make diagnostic processes more difficult, as will the fact that we're dealing with people who in many ways are at earlier stages of their psychological development. And further complications will arise from the autistic tendencies, those features that might be related to ADHD, but of course we do come across these highly specialist areas where I think it is true to say many general mental health colleagues of ours would feel unskilled, those areas, as I've mentioned, of severe aggression, severe self-injurious tendencies, and also another area that we're researching at the moment, probably the raised rate of what we call cyclical mood and behaviour disorders, what used to be called manic depressive or bipolar states, which may on occasion underlie challenging behaviours, again, a common British phrase, actions speak louder than words. If you have communication difficulties, you will dis uh, convey your distress, you will communicate it through your behaviour. And the more emotionally distressed you are, the more intense your challenging behaviours will be. We've shared that the severity of the intellectual disability is a vital issue. I've started to share with you that if you have a developmental disability, you are more vulnerable to this entire list of social adversities and disadvantages. So it makes sense that before I start in trying to provide, to prescribe a fancy psychotherapy or a medication, we should be trying to address all these social factors first, as well as thinking about the cause, which may be social or maybe more biological. But we are aware that another vital factor in predicting the severity of mental health problems in individuals with intellectual disability is the coexistence of an autism spectrum disorder. I'm going to return to the Isle of Wight study now, not just because I'm in love with the island, but because there's other important information relating to it. And you may be aware that one, probably the most revered, famous and respected child psychiatrist in the world is my colleague, Professor Michael Rutter, and so I feel in a safe environment, because he is, isn't here, to share with you with a wry smile that although Professor Rutter is an amazing man, he got it wrong. And why did he get it wrong? Because of the technology available at the time, he and his colleagues identified that the level of intellectual disability and the quality of your social environment and upbringing are indeed vital in predicting the likelihood of having a mental health challenge and the number of them and their severity. But at the time, he and his colleagues said, the cause of your disabilities isn't important. 
What they really meant was, with the current technologies, we can't identify any causes which are important. But that's all changed. Because we now understand there's a range of conditions with so-called behavioral phenotypes. In other words, a specific underlying cause that does contribute towards one having particular developmental and indeed mental health challenges. And we've talked about some of the social causes already, and it's important that I've done that first, because I'll now share with you a small amount of important information on more genetic and biological causes. And I want to start with the most common identifiable cause of intellectual disability in the world, Down syndrome. It still occurs at a rate of about one in 550 live births. And as you will be aware already, it is a major cause of intellectual disability. However, there are other features which are important. We're aware, and this is important, that that genetic predisposition leads to a particular personality style. Individuals are often referred to as being friendly, amiable, sociable. There's a phrase that was used, that some of you understand, a lively sense of the ridiculous. Uh, however, the problem has been that it's led to a myth that if you have Down syndrome, you cannot have autism or indeed any other developmental disability like ADHD. I wish that were true. Uh, I think one problem is that if you have that particular personality style, then it may mask the autism. Uh, but there's also an issue that if you compare groups of children with Down syndrome with those who have a similar IQ but don't have Down syndrome, then you find that the rates of autism and ADHD are lower in the Down syndrome group. So that if you look at autism, probably as many as 10% of children with Down syndrome have autism. That's a lower level than the 50% in children with severe learning difficulties otherwise, but much higher than the general population. And you know, I often see parents who are in extreme distress because they say to me, I've read all about how my child with Down syndrome should be so friendly and sociable and communicative and playful, and she's not. She doesn't socialize, she doesn't communicate. What have I been doing wrong? And of course the answer is you haven't been doing anything wrong. You've been doing enormous amounts of correct child rearing. But importantly, your child has in addition to intellectual disability and autism spectrum condition, and both of them have been caused by the Down syndrome. <coughs> the same argument applies to the ADHD, where probably as many as 30% of children with Down syndrome have ADHD, usually it's undiagnosed, and that's a lot higher than the 3 to 5% in the general population. Sadly, but importantly, when individuals with Down syndrome enter into late adolescence and early ad adulthood, they are much more vulnerable to clinical depression. Even when you control for the presence of many stressful life events, many what we call daily hassles, those small irritating experiences which add up to distress one, even when we control for that, we recognize that sadly, young adults with Down syndrome are much more prone to depression, which must be diagnosed because again, it can be very readily treated. And even more sadly, some of you will be aware that in middle age, individuals with Down syndrome are much more vulnerable to Alzheimer's form of pre-senile dementia. I'm going to move on now to the most common identifiable inherited cause of intellectual disability. Down syndrome is almost never inherited. And we're talking about fragile X syndrome. This is almost certainly underdiagnosed for a number of reasons. Firstly, the individuals physically look very normal, even quite handsome or beautiful. Secondly, their intellectual disability can actually be quite mild. So we have the mistaken belief that because it's mild, the cause must be social rather than biological. And thirdly, the actual mental health challenges can be very subtle. But as you can see from this slide, as well as having intellectual disability, there is an unevenness in terms of their mental abilities. 
Their language can be quite good, but their ability in so-called non-verbal skills, for example, mathematics, number work, visuospatial abilities, the ability to think in sequences of information, which is important to be able to learn and relate to others, can be impaired as well. And indeed, the individuals show a wide range of autistic-like features, as you can see from this slide. However, what's more important, if you like, is that these children are rather irritating in that they haven't read the textbooks. Not even mine. They don't know that they're supposed to have or not have autism. They have all certain autistic-like features, so that characteristically the individual with Down syndrome has a friendly uh, and socially aware, or by, be it rather shy, rather shy and socially anxious personality in the presence of certain autistic-like features. As you can see, the social anxiety, the unpleasant sensation with direct eye contact, the self-injury I've mentioned, and the general delays in play and behaviours. And you can actually ask certain questions about the relationship here between a genetic cause, in this instance, Fragile X syndrome, and the consequence, and we're talking about autism here. In answer to the question, what percentage of people with autism have Fragile X syndrome, the answer is not a lot, but far more than any other cause of autism that we're aware of. So I would argue to you that any individual with autism, particularly if they have associated intellectual disability, should be being tested for Fragile X syndrome. You can ask another question, which is what percentage of people with Fragile X syndrome have autism? And I guess the answer is it depends whose paper you read. If you read mine, then it's about a third. And worryingly, when we follow up these individuals, the rate of autism seems to have increased. We're not sure whether that's because it's more easy to diagnose autism in older individuals, whether they're more ready to come for an assessment, or whether there might be something about their developmental challenges, which means that as they enter adulthood, the increasing social and language demands that they will experience mean that their disabilities become more emphasised and more problematic for them. I've already mentioned fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and its importance and the fact that it is almost certainly seriously underdiagnosed. Why? Because firstly, it depends on being able to have a history of the mother having misused alcohol through the pregnancy. Secondly, we have this mistaken belief that individuals with this condition have to look very strange and different. <coughs> and in reality, they often look very normal and so we often now prefer the term alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disabilities. And thirdly, the challenges can be quite subtle. So as you see, the IQ may just be in the mild intellectual disability range or even within the normal range. They may have certain problems with school subjects, but perhaps not over seriously, but they are more prone to being very irritable and anxious children who then later develop far higher rates of autism spectrum conditions and ADHD as well. And this is a very seriously affected group. And just very briefly, I want to share with you a legal paradox. In the United States, the law says that even the unborn baby has legal rights. To the extent that some individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder are now suing their parents for the abuse and the brain damage they've experienced as a consequence of their mother's behaviour, alcohol drinking during pregnancy. In England, our law is different. The unborn baby has no rights. And so the individual with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder cannot sue their mother. And it just reminds us of this very important and complicated interaction, not just between the biological and the social, but also the legal as well. I want to return to this issue just to remind us that developmental disabilities don't require a low IQ, but if you have some brain challenge, for example, cerebral palsy, that will dramatically increase your risk of having a mental health problem. This is work by my colleague, Professor Rob Goodman, a national study in the United Kingdom. Look at that, as many as 40% of these young people, almost all who don't have an intellectual disability, 
and yet they have very high rates of mental health problems. However, the best predictor of having a mental health problem is still having a lower IQ. But, ultimately, the most important reasons that people have mental health problems are the same as the reasons they have physical health problems, whether they have an intellectual disability or not, and those are the social adversities. The most important of those being poverty. So it's very easy. The simplest and most important and effective way to reduce, to minimize mental as well as physical health problems in the whole population is to cure poverty. A bit tricky to do, but I think it's a very important message that we share and understand. How do we help, and this is very important because in the latter half of my talk, I want to help us understand there's a lot of things we can do. A lot of evidence-based, cost-effective interventions. Our previous Prime Minister, in, Tony Blair, in the United Kingdom, one of his famous remarks when asked what is the import, most important part of society policy, he said, there are three, education, education, and education. And I think this applies here. Probably the most important component in helping individuals with developmental disabilities is the right educational input. I'd argue where they receive it is probably not as important as what they receive. And it's not infrequent, it's not uncommon for a child to present to me with seemingly very severe mental health challenges and challenging behaviour, and once they're receiving the right education, these problems diminish dramatically. However, other spe more specialist approaches like social and language skill groups for those with autistic tendencies and cognitive psychotherapeutic and behavioural approaches can be extremely useful as well. And as evidence of the importance of a multidisciplinary team, it's vital that one has the support of specialists in speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, and occasionally, just occasionally, the specialist area that I can provide more than many other people, the use of certain modern uh, and actually very beneficial medications in addition to all the above. Not instead of or a substitute, in addition. As a means to an end, not an end in itself. And there are a whole range of evidence-based psychological therapies that I don't have time to go into in detail, but they are there. And I'm very happy to share this series of slides with any of you. So if I leave it with Jean and her colleagues here, then you can ask for it to be passed on to you electronically. And there are also a range of very evident medical treatments as well. And I heard the word risperidone mentioned from Mike, uh, one word I could understand in his Hebrew presentation. And I think that we psychiatrists need to be very, very careful not to just have one, one weapon one treatment, risperidone, which has a lot of issues of its own. But for example, we've heard already just how serious sleep problems can be in individuals with developmental disabilities. And if you have a family member or a child with, with sleep problems, you as a parent will have sleep problems as well. You as a parent may get as little as two to three hours of fragmented, incomplete sleep a night. So no wonder you are feeling depressed and can't cope and we have been exploring certain medications that can help young people with developmental disabilities and severe sleep problems and which are relatively safe. This is a medicine which does help children to stay asleep as well as being quite useful for some features of ADHD with certain benefits over more commonly prescribed ADHD medicines like Ritalin, methylphenidate, in that it doesn't stop you from being hungry. Uh, it helps you sleep rather than waking you up. Uh, it treats things like nervous tics and twitching rather than aggravating them. And many of you will have heard of melatonin as well, which is very much used now, very commonly used, to help people get to sleep. And sometimes we combine the two. Melatonin helps you get to sleep. Clonidine helps keep you asleep. It's all right, I'm nearly there. <laughs> This is just 
some brief information on some medications which can help stabilise mood and behaviour. And what's interesting is that these have been historically used for individuals with epilepsy. And more recently, we've identified that even if you've never had an epileptic seizure in your life, these can be very good at balancing mood and behaviour while lacking some of the more serious side effects of more traditional medications for this area of mental health, uh, for example, lithium. I just want to share with you briefly the headlines from the previous few slides, which were that we started to explore areas of mental health that we never used to think were associated with developmental disabilities. And an important example of that is groups of usually young women with severe eating disorders like anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa, and we're actually identifying that there are dramatically increased rates of autism spectrum conditions in association with the eating problems, which clearly need to be taken into account in any therapeutic package. So just to conclude now, trying to bring together the enormous amount of information I've been sharing with you, mental health problems, not just in children and young people, but adults as well who have developmental disabilities are very common, much more common than in the general population. They're usually much more severe, greater in number, and more challenging, both in terms of your experience as an individual and also in terms of our ability as compassionate professionals to help. They can present in the same ways as in the general population, but also in rather different ways whoops, which require more help and assistance, and they create substantial problems, not just the individual, but their family, and also the community more widely as well. Untreated, there's enormous financial cost, but they are eminently treatable. And my final word to you would be that you need to suspect and explore and search for these mental health problems and identify them and hence be able to treat them in an evidence-based and cost-effective way, and the reality that we can make an enormous difference for this needy group. Thank you very much.